good afternoon um, for the audience who are um, watching, uh, not from uh, watching outside of uh, the Middlebury Institute. My name is Winnie Hay. I'm the uh, career advisor for the Translation, Interpretation, and Localization Management programs. And it's my pleasure to introduce to you today um, Jonathan Reckman. Um, he is a Chinese English interpreter uh, working from China right now. And uh, he's also uh, one of the co-founders of a company by the name of Cadence. He can tell you more about Cadence. Um, but this is his uh, third presentation here on campus. And, uh, and, and every one of his uh, presentation in the past has been terrific because um, he speaks from the perspective of an interpreter. And also he has a lot of uh, experience uh, interpreting in the field that he's talking about. So you are getting a treat today. With that, please welcome Jonathan. Thank you, Thank you all so much for coming out today. Uh, it means a lot to me. Hello, welcome. Uh, all of you who are here um, on campus, I know that there were a number of competing events uh, at lunchtime today, um, and you're all getting ready for your midterm exam. So uh, as a former interpreting student, I know Kind of how stressful and, and full a time this can be uh, and so i really appreciate you coming out certainly to uh, all of the, the people tuning in over web stream as well i'm really happy to uh, to have the opportunity to share this with you so um i am here presenting uh the second of a four-part series called money talks and money talks is uh a presentation of the finance sector for language professionals. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more in a moment um, why we think that's very important. Uh, but the, the theme today is uh, money talks, but what does it talk about? Uh, and so um, we're gonna be looking at the context and content of investor relations, how investors talk to companies, why they talk to companies. Um, actually, I have a little slide. We're gonna be talking about the, the who, what, where, why, and how of investor relations. Um, and uh, throughout that, we're gonna be emphasizing um, what the significance for TILM professionals, but, but primarily interpreters, uh, because that's my own background. Um, just for a quick show of hands, who here in the live audience has attended my first talk, Finance 101? Excellent. So that is just over a half of the room. Um, with that in mind, I'll do a, a, a very quick self-introduction um, and, and a quick review of, of the, uh, the first part of the series. Um, so again, my name is Jonathan Reckman. I was born and raised in New York. Uh, so a, um, a New Yorker by heart uh, and, and of course the, the home of Wall Street. I was trained by the European Union as a Chinese English conference interpreter uh, through a collaborative program they have with the Ministry of Commerce in Beijing. Um, I studied interpreting from 2008 to 2010, and then joined the freelance market being based out of Beijing, where I've been since, uh, since 2008. So it's been 10 years in, uh, in what uh, sometimes feels like myopically the center of the world. You know, from, from, a, from, from China, China feels like the center of, of the world. Beijing feels like the center of China. And, uh, and you really get a tremendous influx of talent and resources from all over the globe that pass through Beijing. Um, because in this day and age, if you want to do something big on the world stage, at some point, you have to say hello to the, uh, the, the big dogs that live just uh, just behind there. Um, as a uh, interpreter, hello, welcome. Um, as, a, uh, as a conference interpreter in Beijing over um, the past 10 years, I've had the opportunity to work with really some of the world's uh, most interesting people um, on earth and, and it's been a real a, a real pleasure i got to hit the hollywood circuit when the u.s china film co-productions were a big deal um, so a lot of the red carpet events and a lot of the movie stars that were passing through beijing to promote their films as the chinese film market developed uh, i got to work with them um, but to be honest as uh, as charming as as um, colin firth may be I found that intellectually, I was drawn much more to my clients in the finance sector. 
Uh, and so with the opportunity to work at large uh, global economic conferences, such as the World Economic Forum, um, the FOAO, uh, the International Finance Forum, and then kind of side by side with some of the leading uh, decision makers in the world economy, central bankers, that's Joe Sautron, um, the uh, vice president of the, the IMF, you mean, um, and then both on the government as well as the, the private sector side. So working with, with uh, very well-known hedge funds, private equity firms, um, I developed a kind of bystanders, uh, bystanders fascination with the finance sector. Uh, and it became something, it, it really began to dominate my intellectual interest uh, in interpreting. Um, and so several years ago, uh, I think in 2014, we launched Cadence, um, which is a provider of language services and it, and it is meant to be a, a full service kind of boutique, translation, interpreting and others uh, to the global business and investment community. Um, and we, we use a number of, of technologies as well as the very best talent on earth um, to, to serve customers primarily in the, in the finance sector. Uh, and when I say the best talent on earth, um, MIST graduates have really played a, a tremendous role in, in our success. So we have over 220 um, interpreters uh, from the MIST community that have uh, joined our platform, um, done over 200 jobs. Uh, we, we, I think pay out more in um, have paid out more in in wages to to misgrads uh, than to uh, grads from any other institution, um, and it's really important to us that the interpreters and translators and localization professionals that we work with have a strong grounding in uh, the the language and the concepts uh, of finance. Um, because that's where our clients work, and, and I certainly don't have to, to tell you guys, in order to properly interpret something, you have to understand the, the, the underlying meaning. It's, it's not just about the words, it's about the concepts behind them. And so it was with that in mind that we launched uh, Money Talks. This is a four-part series on the language of finance. Um, and we've, we've launched it in partnership, of course, with MISS, as well as uh, Training the Street, which is a professional um, financial education firm. Uh, and the next uh, session in the Money Talk series will actually be presented by, by one of their uh, instructors. Um, so they'll be coming here and doing a more in-depth, a more technical um, deep dive into uh, essentially understanding um, financial statements, uh, income statements, balance sheets. That's going to be very, very cool. So look for that. Uh, I think we has been uh, working on the dates with them. So we'll, we'll get dates for yours soon. In um, April. In April. So coming soon. Um, for today, um, I want to start with uh, a very quick review of Finance 101, which is the, which is the first part in the series. Uh, and, and that really begins with who does what on Wall Street. Um, so we're going to just use a couple of minutes to get the main cast of characters uh, back onto stage. Uh, and then we're gonna we're gonna look more closely at um, at what each of the scenes look like and and what they talk about um, when they when they when they talk to one another. So who does what on Wall Street? Um, this may be familiar. Uh, we we discussed last time uh, Lucy and her lemonade stand. Um, entrepreneurs start companies. This is not a complex concept. Um, at a very early stage, they're called startups. Um, but look, a company is a company. So Cadence, we're a small company. Uh, Walmart's a big company. They all started with a Lucy that, that founded a company um, with a product. Hello, welcome. And, uh, and has, has found some happy customers. Um, as Lucy uh, grows her little lemonade stand, um, she receives seed capital or early stage funding from friends and family, which uh, is pretty self-explanatory, as well as angel investors. Um, who are like friends and family, but they have more money. And uh, unless your friends and family have a lot of money, which there are angels too. Uh, but in any case, these are individuals that say, you've got a great product, I love your lemonade, you seem like a great, uh, you seem like a great potential leader, uh, I'm gonna back your vision and help you uh, get from zero to one, as they say, get, get started. Um, once you've gotten started and, and you're looking to scale that company up, you turn to uh, successively venture capital 
and private equity investors. And uh, these are, once you go from, from the angel level to the venture capital and private equity level, uh, you're no longer talking about individuals. You are now talking to institutions, specifically to funds. Um, and funds are structured where they take in money from outside sources, uh, generally uh, are called limited partners or LPs. And then the funds are managed by general partners or GPs who are responsible for, for allocating that money to productive, uh, successful companies. Um, and I, I put this little unicorn up here because that is the typical Silicon Valley uh, target is to grow your little lemonade stand into a lemonade unicorn. Um, so this is where if you hear the terms A round, B round, C round, D round, um, this is all growth phases of, uh, of a private company. Um, and again, it's important to emphasize that all of the investment that we're talking about uh, from the friends and families to angels to VC to PE, this is all technically called private equity. Even though private equity, uh, again, this is, was covered in the first session, it really means two things. It's a, it's a type of fund that invests at in later stage mature growth companies, but it also is a concept that refers to any um, private investment that is done in a non-listed company. Uh, so from the time a company is founded as a startup up until the point that it IPOs um, with the help of investment banks, uh, up to the point that it, it lists on the stock market and is publicly traded, it's considered private equity. Then you have the lovely, charming investment bankers um, who come in and help a large, a large private company prepare to go public. They prepare to IPO. They prepare to list. All of these terms from a vocabulary standpoint are fairly interchangeable. Um, and you've all seen you hit the gong at the New York Stock Exchange or elsewhere, and that represents that what was once private equity is now publicly traded, is now public equity, or is now, uh, is now on the stock market. And anybody can buy or sell that stuff. Um, those anybody's can be retail investors, uh, and that could be you or me. Um, and we go log on to Charles Schwab and we say, hmm, Lucy Lemonade sounds like a good company. I'm gonna buy some Lucy Lemonade stuff. Uh, I wouldn't recommend that. Um, this is a uh, finance for language professionals uh, seminar. It is not intended to be an investment advisory seminar. So I'm not in the business of peddling advice, but I, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't go around you know, putting all your money in, in Lucy Lemonade stock or any single stock for that matter. Um, if uh, once again, going from the individual level to the, to the fund level, um, hedge funds, uh, they don't just buy stock, they sell stock, they swap stock, they do, uh, and it's not just stock, it's corporate bonds, it's derivatives, which are um, essentially complicated legal contracts that entitle you to, um, that can offer you exposure to uh, the trading value of, of underlying assets. Sorry, I made that unnecessarily complicated. We'll talk about it later. Um, but in any case, uh, hedge funds are also like the VC and PE stru uh, funds structured with limited partners that give the hedge funds money and tell them, you go manage it. Uh, and then the hedge funds go manage it and they collect a little fee uh, for their troubles. Um, and then on top, uh, really superseding all of this, are institutional investors. And institutional investors are kind of where all the money comes from. So the venture capital funds and the private equity funds and the hedge funds, they all might receive money from institutional investors uh, as a the institutional investors would be LPs in this fund that are run by the GPs. And um, the institutional investors invest in virtually everything. Um, this is a drastically oversimplified, uh, what is called an asset allocation chart. Um, but if you do a Google image search for asset allocation, it will almost always yield a lot of pie charts, right? Because it says you have 100% of your $100 billion. Um, how much are you going to put in equity, which just means stocks? How much are you going to put in debt, which means bonds? 
how much are you going to leave in cash? Uh, you can institutional investors hold real estate, they hold gold, they hold commodities. Uh, this is spread into direct investments, which would be buying stock directly on the stock market. And then here are future, futures and options. So those are different forms of derivatives we talked about. Um, there could be, uh, again, the institutional investors might invest in companies directly, or they might invest in funds that then invest in, uh, in companies. Um, and these invest institutional investors are typically, uh, the, the most common examples are things like pensions. Um, so the state of California, for example, has out of God knows how many state workers and they all have a pension. Uh, and that pension is, is essentially an institutional investor. The same would be true with a university endowment or a college endowment. So I'm sure that I, I suspect that Miss has an endowment uh, and that it, is, it, it does when the is shaking her head. Um, so that would also be an institutional investor that might take a portion of its uh, fund and, and give a portion of it to a venture capitalist in, in San Francisco and say, go invest in some tech companies. So these are your the main players in the game. Um, and this is the, the kind of handy chart uh, that has a lot of words on it, but is just a recap of what we've talked about. Um, there are, uh, on the investor side, um, doing private equity, angels, venture capital, private equity, institutional investors. On the public equity or stock trading side, you have retail investors, day traders, hedge funds. Um, this is all a recap from the last session. Uh, some of you have heard this before. For some of you, it is new. Um, from here on out, we're going to be, we're going to be jumping into investor relations, uh, which is basically how do the investors on this side talk to companies on this side, and what do they talk about, and where do they have these conversations? Um, before we move into that, are there any questions about this, the, the larger map, the landscape of who is yes. What is angels? What is angels? Yeah. So angel investors are just individuals that happen to have quite a bit of money, and they invest in companies at a very early stage. Really, just out of they kind of make an individual call. Um, they say, "I think your, you know, I think your lemonade is going to take over the world. I want to support you." There are also technically angel funds. Um, that are just very small venture capital funds. It's kind of a fuzzy thing. Great. Moving along then, uh, investor relations is <coughs> talking to whom? And because I was educated in America, my grammar education was not great, and it took me a long time to get this right. <laughs> Even as a language professional myself. Uh, so again, just to, uh, to set the stage, um, for the purposes of, of what's coming, uh, remember that investors are called the buy side uh, because they are buying assets. The brokers are called the sell side, and the brokers are typically investment banks or financial advisors, and the companies are often referred to as management. So um, that's just when you when take these terms as interchangeable. Uh, if you hear management, it means the companies. Uh, it could also be founders or entrepreneurs represents the companies. Um, and then it's a, the only, I think, buy side as investors is pretty straightforward. It's a little confusing that the brokers are sell side. Uh, I mean, in a strict sense, it's the companies that are selling stock, but the, uh, the investment banks represent them, the brokers represent them. Or if um, who else might you know be part of these conversations that take place? Um, investors, or specifically, who else might investors want to talk to when they are evaluating a company? Besides talking to the company themselves, besides talking to their sell side brokers, they might talk to a company's competitors. They might talk to former employees who, who know something about how the company runs, but are not. Uh, insiders, and we'll talk about that later. Um, and of course, there are always consultants, um, as well as what are called subject matter experts. Uh, 
uh, and that means an, an expert in a particular field. So if I am a uh, private equity fund and I'm about to invest in a sausage factory, I might want to talk to a expert sausage maker who knows all the inner workings of how sausage is made um, because it's a very technical subject that some you know, cell site research analyst at JP Morgan might not actually know that much about making sausage. Um, so there are uh, increasingly, um, there's a trend to, to consult actual technical experts uh, before making investment decisions. So that's our cast of characters. Um, we're going to go through a, uh, a, a list of the venues um, at which investors and companies talk to one another. And we're going to do it like we did with the, the uh, who's who on Wall Street. We're going to start at the very bottom um, with early stage companies. And then we're going to work our way up through private equity, through IPO, and then into the, into the uh, kind of public equity sphere. So it starts with the pitch. Um, and as a startup founder myself uh, with, with Cadence, I can assure you this is, we have all been in this situation. Uh, and the pitch, um, I think, pretty much covers everything from friends and family to angels to venture capital um, and, and to some extent private equity. And it's basically you know, you're a, you're, you're a group of entrepreneurs and you have, at first you just have a vision and then you have what's called a little traction, meaning you started to get going a little bit um, and you want more resources to grow your company. And so you come to this guy or this woman and uh, you say, I need some money. And uh, then it's on you to convince this person um, why they should give it to you. And, uh, and, and so after we go through the, the venues of conversation, we'll be talking about um, what, what those conversations actually look like, what, what, what this person wants to know before they invest in these people. Um, so the, the pitch is, is the most direct form of investor company engagement, and it can be as informal as a coffee chat, and it can be uh, as formal, um, for example, in, in later stage private equity deals, as, um, as a real conference. Uh, and so interpreters are engaged, again, usually at later stages, um, to, to work with, uh, to help foreign companies or to help companies pitch to foreign investors. Um, or if you're being hired by the investor side and you're looking at a number of companies, you know, the investor might sit right here and there's a, so for example, in China, there are a number of Chinese VC funds that are interested in American companies or in Israeli companies or in Canadian companies, and they'll invite delegations to, to pass through and do their pitches, and they'll have simultaneous or, or consecutive interpreters uh, to help with that. Um, once you are kind of well in the private equity realm, you're a growth company and you're getting ready to IPO, uh, your investment bank will take you on a roadshow. And the roadshow is literally that. It's a, uh, a tour um, that you make to major financial capitals around the world um, and where, where basically wherever there's money. So you go to New York, you go to Hong Kong, you go to London, um, you go to, uh, if it's just a domestic play, Chicago and, and San Francisco and Los Angeles. Um, but if it's international, certainly there will be uh, interpreters involved. Um, and the investment bank is introducing you to investors, uh, and it's kind of a, it's, it's still sort of a pitch, um, but instead of saying, write me a check right now, it is building interest in the, in the IPO. So it says like, you know, we are going to list on January 17th, um, and when, when that bell rings, we want you to be among the first buyers of our stock. Uh, when it goes public. Um, so that's the, the purpose of the roadshow. Once a company is public, uh, how do investors communicate with, um, uh, how do companies communicate with investors? Um, I just found this uh, when I did, a, all of this is powered by Google Image Search. I love Google Image. Um, but make SEC filings great again, whatever. Um, 
the, the first and foremost way that companies uh, conduct investor relations after they become public is through SEC filings. Um, so that is uh, one of the outstanding characteristics of being a public company is that you have to make quarterly and annual disclosures about the financial uh, health of your company, um, in including um, a lot of your 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 revenues um, and your 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 expenses. We'll we'll talk a little bit more about those. Um, but the two major types of filings are called ten a ten Q, uh, which is your quarterly report, and your ten K, which is an annual report. Um, Q obviously stands for quarterly. I don't know why K is the annual report. Um, and uh, that is uh, a great opportunity for the investing public, whether you're you know, retail investors uh, or, or large hedge funds, you get a lot of your information, a lot of your data from these filings. Um, it's not so great for the companies. Uh, and a, one of the reasons why some of the huge Silicon Valley unicorns today uh, Uber and Airbnb, one of the reasons they have not been in a rush to go public is because they don't want to do these filings. Because Uber's revenues, for example, is uh, a very kind of sensitive secret. Um, and if they go public, then all of a sudden you have the whole universe is combing through your numbers every, every three months. Now, to help investors make sense of what are essentially just data filings, um, the companies generally hold what are called earnings calls, uh, and those are also quarterly. And so they're done typically right after they announce their earnings um, in, the, in the 10 Qs. And they have what, up until the 90s, I think, were a closed conference call with select investors um, to kind of walk them through what their quarterly, quarterly earnings mean. Um, help, help add a little bit of qualitative color to what is otherwise a quantitative report. Um, since the 90s, since webcasting has, put, has made conference calls uh, more, you don't actually have to dial in, these now are entirely public. So virtually any public company that you're interested in, uh, if you want to know about um, you know, Tesla, their quarterly earnings come out, you can dial in to the earnings call um, and you'll get uh, usually the, the, the CEO, you're not going to get Elon Musk on the call, um, but either the CFO, the chief financial officer, or their head of investor relations will be available uh, to kind of present the company's narrative on what this what the quarterly earnings mean, um, as well as answer questions from analysts. Uh, and we have been, uh, at, at Cadence, we've become very interested in the potential market demand for interpreting earnings calls. Uh, they, they are done um, in, in certain cases, there are uh, foreign equities. So for example, Korean companies, uh, a lot of Korean companies and Japanese companies that do their earnings calls in local language uh, and then have them interpreted. There are also a number of European companies that I think will do two versions of their earnings calls. So I, I think there's a number of French and Spanish companies that will hold a French earnings call uh, in their morning and then do an English earnings call in the afternoon, which is, which is morning New York time. Um, and so, so there are opportunities for, uh, for interpreting and earnings calls, but it's extraordinarily challenging. Um, these are pretty information, pretty numbers dense uh, conversations um, where you're, you're, you're really putting your mouth to the fire hose. Uh, there's a lot coming out in a very short period of time and a lot of industry specific jargon. Um, there are also something called annual reports, which are different from the 10Ks. So the, the 10K is a regulatory filing that a company submits to the SEC, to the government. Uh, and, and I 
fairly certain this is true in any country uh, with with a security regulator. They they do kind of the same thing. Um, but it's a a statement of the company's finances uh, that goes to the reg the regulators and is and is also publicly available. Annual reports uh, generally refer to what are, are in full called the annual report to shareholders. Uh, these are also public documents, but the company prepares them, uh, and it's kind of half investor relations, half public relations. So you know, if you look at an SEC 10K, it's very, very bland. It, you know, it's it's not an exciting read. Um, annual reports. Well, I'm not going to say they're exciting reads, but they're glossy, right? They're uh, they're much more. Uh, much more graphic design, cute little infographics. Um, it's it's much friendlier, and it emphasizes the the narrative of the company as well as the the finances. Uh, and so those are um, legally required to be sent to all of the shareholders of the company, um, but are are also made publicly available. In addition to the annual report, companies communicate with their shareholders at the sh annual shareholder meetings. Um, these can be a very small deal uh, for small companies that nobody really cares about, or they can be enormous annual events. Does everybody recognize who this is? Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett. Um, so Warren Buffett uh, is the, um, the wise sage of investing. Um, his investment firm is called Berkshire Hathaway, and uh, you can see every every year when he does his annual shareholder meeting, he literally fills a stadium in Omaha. Uh, again, I'm, I'm based in China, so most of my anecdotes will be will be slanted towards China. But um, there are literally plane loads of Chinese that fly to Omaha every year to attend the the Berkshire Hathaway annual shareholder meeting. Uh, it's become sort of like a, uh, a hajj, um, and, and Omaha is the mecca that investors travel to to hear the wise, the wise prophets speak. Uh, so this is an instance in which shareholder meetings have taken on a hugely outside significance. These are definitely interpreted into many multiple languages. Um, both for, for the live audience as well as, uh, as, as over the internet. Um, now, just last week or two weeks ago, um, there was a, an interesting and provocative statement uh, by this guy, uh, Jamie Dimon, the uh, chairman of uh, the CEO of JP Morgan Chase, um, who described shareholder meetings as a complete waste of time. Um, the reason that he calls them a complete waste of time uh, is that, you know, this is an opportunity where any shareholders, if you own one share of stock in JP Morgan, you are entitled to attend the annual shareholders meeting, and there is a long line of people that get to ask questions of the management, in this case, Jamie Dimon. Um, the reason why he calls them a complete waste of time is he claims that the annual shareholders meetings have been hijacked. The mechanism, this form of communication has been hijacked, not on behalf of investors that are trying to achieve a financial purpose, but by activists that are trying to achieve all sorts of political purposes. And so they use the investor, the, the annual shareholder meeting as a way to publicly question or publicly humiliate management and ask sensitive questions about, you know, why do you invest in companies that make guns or, uh, you know, the Coca-Cola, you know, conference, it'll be something about, you know, obesity or uh, whatever, you know, um, you go to Walmart and talk about labor rights. And which is not to say that those are invalid things to talk about. We absolutely should be talking about them. Um, but as a forum for investor communications, the annual shareholders meeting has sort of been uh, has been compromised uh, or or is 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 actively manipulated. Um, so the other subtext here is that uh, Jamie Dimon is sort of implying, and this is why he sort of comes under fire, 
um, that individual investors don't really matter. That the little shareholder, you know, a retiree that owns 10 shares of stock or, you know, a student that is interested in, in dabbling in investment. Um, honestly, JP Morgan doesn't care about you. Uh, JP Morgan cares about the big investors, huge um, institutional investors and hedge funds that are buying millions or billions of dollars worth of their stock. And those investors are not really coming to the annual shareholders meeting, or if they are, they're not asking questions in that forum um, because they, uh, they don't need such a public venue for uh, asking those questions. Um, the major investors typically get corporate access. And I've put maybe unfairly a uh, picture of a dark smoky room where, you know, the, um, all the, the powerful, you know, men behind the scenes get to manipulate the world economy. Um, but it is, uh, it's, a, it's a really interesting kind of aspect of investor relations is this concept of corporate access. And so what that basically means is a, um, somebody on the buy side uh, has a relationship with usually somebody on the, on the sell side, one of the brokers, one of the investment banks, and is talking to their contacts there all the time about a company they're interested in. So let's say Tesla. Let's say, you know, I'm a, I'm a hedge fund and I'm, I'm really curious about Tesla's uh, uh, plans for, you know, their, their new factory. Um, and I just, I just want to understand as much as I can. I've been looking at all the public information, but I really want to get a, what they often say, more color. Um, so I just want to, I just want to understand. I, I just have some, some, a couple more questions. Uh, and I'd really like to talk to somebody at Tesla's management. So the sell side broker, um, you know, an advisor, uh, will, set up a meeting, uh, which are corporate access meetings. And that um, is also uh, a, a forum um, where interpreters come into play uh, often when investors are looking at foreign companies. There, the investment banks uh, will set up private meetings between a specific group of investors and somebody on the management team. And that could be as high as the CEO, uh, or it could be someone directly responsible for a section of the business that the investors are curious about. Um, now, we'll talk a little bit more uh, about um, Compliance and uh, public what 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 is what is public information and what is not public information. Um, but again, this this section is really just talking about uh, the venues in which people talk. Um, and and since we're going there, I, I had to add the last stage that uh, the the last slide, which again is a little cheeky, um, but that investors and uh, companies also talk to each other sometimes over the golf course. Um, and so that is, you know, I'm the CEO of a big company, you're the CEO of a big investment firm, we're all part of the same country club, let's spend an afternoon on all the links. Um, this, is where, uh, this is where things can get pretty shady from, uh, you've heard the term insider trading standpoint. Um, you know, so how's business going these days, right? Uh, if I say business is going great, have I told you any, have I told you insider information? If I told you, oh, business, well, next week, you know, you're gonna, <laughs> we have some good news. Have I told you anything? It's very, it's a lot of gray areas when, when you have these private conversations uh, in private settings, and I assure you interpreters are not here. Um, but, uh, when you, you know, again, in the, in the overall scheme from, uh, of how investors and companies talk to one another, it would be remiss not to uh, to include um, the golf course. Okay, 
what do investors want to know about companies? Um, so I've just listed out all these different, essentially, venues. Uh, what, is the, what is the content of this conversation? Um, when you remind me again, what's my, what's my time look like? 145. 145, okay. Uh, so uh, I asked because investors want to know a lot. And I've broken the types of information that they want into three different categories. Uh, and the first is narrative. Um, so this is true. Uh, I, I should preface this by saying, um, I'm about to give you a huge list of different things that investors want to know about companies. Investors are more interested in certain parts at different stages in the company's life. Uh, so what investors want to know about a startup is a little, the focus will be different than what they want to know about Walmart. Um, but in essence, they're all, it's all the kind of same sorts of information, just maybe a different, different emphasis at different stages. Uh, so at the, the, the beginning is, is the kind of the narrative and, or narrative information generally. Uh, and so there's many different types of narrative. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to try and sprint through most of them. Um, the first is the value proposition. <laughs> uh, what exactly does your company do? What exactly would you say you do here? Does anybody recognize this slide? Office space. Office space, good. Glad. Not dating myself too much. Uh, must watch for, any, uh, for anybody interested in corporate affairs. Uh, the 1990s comedy office space. Uh, so a value proposition is basically um, a statement of what makes you special? And so uh, if you remember the um, description I had of Cadence earlier, uh, we can break a value proposition down into a couple of parts. Um, who are you? Who do you serve? What are you selling? And what differentiates you? Those are the, the kind of four parts of any <coughs> value proposition should be who are you, what are you selling, to whom, and why are you different? So Lucy Lemonade uh, provides um, refreshing drinks to the thirsty public, uh, and we are all organic, or whatever it is, right? Um, so that, that would be the value proposition. And, and it's essentially the first and most important thing that uh, any investor wants to know about a company. Um, the second most important kind of narrative, uh, and this is both a kind of quantitative and qualitative question, is what's the market you're serving and how big could that market potentially be? And uh, again, this comes up a lot in, uh, in early stage companies, uh, as well as uh, I, I think throughout the, the venture capital cycle. Um, there's actually a number of ways of thinking about uh, market size. So the total available market is just, you know, if you used your imagination, how much of your stuff, how much demand is there for this kind of stuff, right? Uh, so if I'm selling lemonade, maybe the total available market are, is like the amount of money that people spend on drinks all drinks in a year, right? The served available market, and there are, there are many uh, variations from a vocabulary standpoint. It's also sometimes called the serviceable market or the addressable market. Yeah, there's the total available market and then the accessible market. And so that basically means um, more realistically, coming down from the theoretical level, uh, how many people can you reach with your product given your sales channels? So for Lucy and her lemonade stand, she might say, well, uh, I can reach, you know, I'm gonna have lemonade, lemonade stands on street corners all over uh, North America. Um, so I'll be targeting like, you know, the community of, um, uh, you know, community buyers uh, in suburban communities in America. That's my, you know, of the total universe, that's the, the part that's accessible to me. And then the target market, again, usually for a startup, is of all of those people, 
who are your most likely buyers that you're gonna you're gonna target first? Um, and so that might be uh, kids getting off the school bus might be my my target market. That's what I'm gonna address first. Um, so target market is like immediate served available or accessible market is kind of that's the midterm strategy and, and what is within within immediate reach and then the total available market is use your imagination think big if I invest in your company and we you know grow to be a mega unicorn how much how much are we talking about how much do we need? Uh, these are very important questions for investors um, next is distribution channels uh, and I, uh, I put a picture of a drug deal up here um, because drug dealers are kind of famous. That's the core of their business is distributing product. Uh, and it's how do I get the product in your hand and get money from you. Um, and so that could be a, you know, a narrative story of, uh, of where is your product available and, and how, do I, how do I get to it. Um, oh man, this is, I'm going to skip this one. So much. <laughs> Go right to the fun stuff. Uh, this I put up for competitors. You guys all saw the Super Bowl, right? Um, so investors are going to ask, who are your competitors? Uh, how are they positioned in the market? How are you different from them? How are you differentiated from your competitors? What advantages do you have? Um, and, uh, and, and what does the competitive landscape look like moving forward? Um, they're also going to ask about technology, what is your technology? Um, and they're gonna want, as your company gets bigger and bigger, they're gonna want more and more technical detail about how it works. Um, but, but at least in modern investing, technology is seen as an, an absolute uh, must. Um, it's, it's very hard to get a company funded without some form of proprietary technology. Uh, last, but certainly not least, and actually maybe most importantly, um, they're gonna ask about who are the people in your organization? Uh, who are the founders? Who are your top managers? And um, again, I'm, I'm not in the business of giving uh, investment advice and I'm really not in the business of giving startup advice, uh, but I would, uh, <laughs> if I've learned anything, um, make sure that your starting team has both a business co-founder as well as a technical co-founder. It's really, really important, um, both for the business itself as well as from investor perception. Um, investors want to know, because of how important technology is today, uh, that somebody at the very top is a, is a technologist. Um, it's, it's pretty important these days. Uh, and it's easy to think, like, well, I'm smart, and my you know, business partner is smart, and we're two smart people and we'll go hire some engineers. It's really tough if you don't have uh, an engineer at the top these days. Just speaking from experience. Okay, second um, bucket of uh, information that investors want to know about companies are their financials. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna blast through these pretty quickly because they are, this uh, number two here is essentially will be the subject of the next Money Talk session um, presented by Training the Street, uh, which will go very much in depth into um, what these financials are and, and how to make sense of them. Um, but starting with uh, unit economics uh, is a kind of fancy word. It basically just means when you sell a cup of lemonade, how much money can you get customers to pay and how much do your ingredients cost? You know, what, what, what's the, what are the, yeah, economics of one unit of sale. Um, cash flows are how much is coming in from sales as well as from investment, uh, and how much is going out in terms of your payroll, your operating costs, etc. A balance sheet. Does anybody know why it's called a balance sheet? Because it has to balance up, right? Uh, on one, it's. Uh, I, I don't know about other languages. In in Chinese, the the literal uh, term for a balance sheet is a your assets and liabilities sheet, um, and and so that is what is being balanced essentially. Um, a balance sheet takes your assets, that's everything that you own, 
uh, and then your live minus your liabilities, which is everything you owe, and then whatever's left over that you own minus what you owe is the is the equity in the company. Uh, and so at the very beginning, that equity is belongs entirely to the founders. And if you own more than you owe, then you your your shares are very valuable. Uh, as the company grows, you will sell that equity to uh, to investors, uh, as we just talked about. So you might have uh, many shareholders, um, but when we, in, in a technical sense, what equity means is what's left after you've you've paid your liabilities. It's what's left of your assets. What assets are left uh, after you pay your liabilities are the the equity that the shareholders split essentially. Um, so uh, investors want to know about that, and then they're going to want to know what's called use of proceeds. Um, so remember that the pitch uh, where everybody's kind of crowded about you know asking for money. You know, a big question is what are you going to do with that money? <laughs> uh, and so they want to see a budget and say, okay, you're going to raise five million dollars. Uh, you're going to spend it on legal fees. You're going to spend it on advertising. You're going to send it on um, on hiring new 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 team members. These are the uh, these are. Some typical uh, use of proceeds, and then they're going to want to see this. Anybody, everybody know what this is? Ah, uh, hilarious! Yeah, <laughs> cap table. Um, so a cap table is uh, this was meant to be just a visual pun. This is the much less interesting uh, visual <laughs> representation of a cap table. Um, uh, cap is capital, uh, and it's basically who owns what equity in the. Um, at the very beginning, your cap table is maybe it's just Lucy owns 100% of the company, and then Lucy takes on Charlie Brown as a co-founder, and so it's 50/50. Uh, and then they raise money from friends and family, and so uh, Lucy and Charlie each own 40% of the company, and their friends and family, in aggregate, own 20% of the company. And then they take on venture capital, yada yada yada. And so the list of investors gets longer and longer, and this is the percentage share that they have. Um, this is the actual number of shares of stock, uh, and so investors will want to know who's on the cap table, basically. Um, who am I? Who am I getting into bed with? So to speak. I wonder if we're going. You know, in the you know that is a very common phrase in in venture capital investing is like you know who are your investing bedfellows. Uh, but as we are going through a moment of uh, sexual identity crisis, no, it's not sexual identity crisis, it's sexual assault crisis <laughs> in, uh, in Silicon Valley. I wonder if we're going to have to start reevaluating that vocabulary. Anyway, um, outside the scope of this conversation. Uh, number three, the, the third bucket of um, stuff that investors uh, want to talk about are the non-financial metrics. Um, and so these are just that. Uh, they are they're, they're quantitative, it's quantitative data about the company that is not necessarily financial data. Um, DAU and MAU, does anybody know what that stands for? Anybody? Daily active users and monthly active users. Hugely important in the internet investing space. Uh, anything, especially mobile apps. Uh, it doesn't matter how much money you make, it matters how many gals and mouths you have. Um, uh, same with impressions if you're a content company. You know, uh, if you're if you're Facebook or Twitter, you know, how many people have have, have seen um, a particular post? Um, these are often called vanity metrics, and that's a little derisive, uh, but it's um, actually that's not entirely fair. Impressions are usually seen as a vanity metric. Uh, it's because it's kind of like a feel good PR thing. It's like, you know, 100 million people saw my brand. Well, if they didn't spend any money, it doesn't matter how many people saw your brand, right? Um, DAU and MAU is, is usually uh, is less vain, um, and it is 
uh, of, it's, it's a symbol of real engagement um, that uh, people are using your app every day, and then you can talk about how to monetize that. Right? Um, for, uh, again, with my uh, Sinocentric anecdotes, the Chinese uh, chat tool, WeChat, have you all heard of it? Recently crossed, uh, just last week, announced it had 1 billion uh, monthly active users. Um, so that's, that's a pretty big achievement for them. Billion. Uh, production capacity. Um, again, not a financial metric, but a really important one for many, many businesses. Uh, so this is the Tesla factory, um, which is the subject of a, actually probably the number one kind of question mark that investors have about Tesla is their production capacity, whether or not they can manufacture at the scale that they talk about. Um, and, and so that would be the subject of a lot of uh, kind of corporate access conversations is, is trying to understand better or the earnings calls. They would definitely be asking about, you know, what's the situation on the floor at the factory? They might talk to subject matter experts who are, you know, experts in auto manufacturing and want to know um, how is, you know, what, what, are, what are the technical challenges? Um, but production capacity could also be for your lemonade business. Um, you know, how can you go, you know, it's, how can you go from one, making one pitcher of lemonade to a million pitchers of lemonade without sacrificing, you know, quality and safety. Um, so definitely something that investors dig into. Has anybody heard the term NPS? NPS stands for Net Promoter Score. And again, in the, primarily in the software world, but, but increasingly uh, just across the economy, NPS is a really important metric of consumer satisfaction, user satisfaction. And the way that the NPS is calculated is you conduct a survey of your users. Usually the question that you ask in the survey is, on a scale of one to 10, how likely would you be to recommend this service or this product to a friend? You take the number, the percentage of users that respond with a nine or 10, you subtract the number that say zero to six, you discard these, and what you get is your NPS score, uh, which will be a uh, represent, if it's, if it's above zero, means you have a net positive number of people that wanna promote your product uh, versus those that detract from it. Um, if it's negative, obviously, you, uh, you have to make some changes. Um, but this is a simple formula that has emerged as one of the most popular kind of modern ways of measuring uh, user engagement. Um, okay, so I'll try and cover this in 15 minutes or so. Uh, so that is the main types of information that investors want to know. I want to make some, some distinctions. Um, a couple of um, uh, a couple of dichotomies that are worth parsing out. Um, so one is public versus non-public information, and we, we talked about this with corporate access. And we talked about this with uh, with buddies on the golf course. Um, there is a very clear rule uh, with the SEC that. Um, information that a company, if it gives what is called material information, uh, which means information that would be relevant to investors, if it makes it public to one, if it, sorry, if it makes it available to one group of investors, it has to make it equally available to the entire public. So there should not be any privileged investors that have access to privileged information. They, the entire market should be operating on the same information. That's, a, that's kind of a core principle of, of, public, uh, of public markets. Now, it begs the question, if companies aren't allowed to tell special groups of investors any information that they're not telling the entire market, 
why do investors want private meetings with corporate management? It's, it's a genuine question. Like there, there is research that shows that um, uh, there is a correlation between corporate access, access to talking to managers, and performance in in funds. So funds that have better access to managers get uh, better returns. In theory, those conversations, and, and again, as an interpreter, you wind up in those conversations. And, and I can't say that like they, the conversations are not, hey, tell me all the secrets about your business that you're not telling the public. That doesn't happen. Um, so the, the, the standard answer is that you know, they're getting, what they say is there's no information advantage but there is an analytical advantage that with access to the same information, you, you, know, you can look at the same information in different ways. And that talking to corporate managers, you can help you, can help you get the right perspective on the same publicly available information. Now that's a reasonable you know, stance. Um, but, uh, but it's an important for investors as well as for interpreters uh, who deal with this information um, to, to, to be very sensitive about the distinction between public information and non-public information. Um, and at, at Cadence, a lot of the work that we do are for uh, what are called expert networks, um, which basically help investors talk to um, people who are not corp who are non-insiders. So remember we had that slide uh, competitors, former employees, people who understand the industry well, or subject matter experts who understand an industry really well and can have a very informed conversation and help investors gain perspective, but without telling them anything about the company that is not public. Um, and uh, it's, there is a lot of compliance training, a, a training around by the investors, trained by the experts, trained by the interpreters, to make sure that in those conversations, no non-public information is revealed. Uh, if an investor comes upon information that is non-public and material, what they're supposed to do is lock themselves from trading on that information for a certain period of time. Um, and and because the penalties of breaking, the, the penalties for insider trading are so high, uh, funds take this very seriously. And so they always begin these conversations by saying, do not tell me non-public information. If you do, I can no longer trade this company. And so the whole point of having this conversation is because I'm interested, I want to trade this company. If you tell me something I'm not supposed to hear, it defeats my entire purpose. Now, of course, sometimes they do actually wind up trading them. Uh, another important distinction is between public and private equity. Um, and the, you know, we, we've talked conceptually, uh, we all know uh, before you list, you're a private company, after you list, you're a public company, you have uh, the, the filings obligation, so you have to disclose your financial statement every quarter. Um, but the, the reason I, I draw this distinction is because everything I just said about insider trading essentially only applies to public companies. In the world of private equity, there is very much an information advantage. The more you can know about a company, uh, the, better, um, the, 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 the better opportunity you have to, to trade on or to make smart investing decisions. Um, and so there is a very active market um, for uh, intelligence, corporate intelligence on private companies. And there's a equally large derivative market for interpreting to help understand, uh, to, to gain intelligence on, on private companies. Um, and there is, no, there is essentially no insider trading when it comes to, to private equity. There is fraud. Um, so, for example, if, if I'm the founder of a company, and as a founder, I know that there is something really bad, 
there's something really terrible with my company. Like something's gone awful. Uh, that you know, we lost all our customers. Um, if I sell my shares in a private transaction to an investor, you know, if we raise money um, and sell a bunch of shares to investors, and we don't tell them that, that's not insider trading, but it is fraud. Um, and so, so it, it's it's not fair to say that private equity is just a wild west where anybody can you know, lie to anybody or steal any information. Um, but, you know, generally speaking, it's not subject to the same standards of uh, public uh, material information that, uh, that the public markets are. Um, also, anecdotally, I, I have to say, interpreters themselves can be notorious insider traders on non-public uh, assets. So one example is the uh, the Olympics. Uh, the, the next Winter Olympics are going to be held in China in uh, a town called Chongli. And before this information was made public um, to to the world, uh, interpreters who had been involved with all of the IOC meetings knew that the decision had been made and bought a ton of real estate outside in in Chongqing area. Now, you know, real estate is not a publicly traded security. Um, and there's they didn't violate any laws. It's perfectly, you know, they they saw a future, you know, market move and like take advantage of it. Not saying who, just saying it's happened. Uh, so now this is also important to note. Uh, there may not be securities law around this, but there are professional ethics. And I'm not recommending that you use, it is still insider information. Uh, and I'm not advising, that I would advise against, uh, from a professionally ethical standpoint, I would advise against making investment decisions based on privileged information that you come across as an interpreter. Um, I want to draw a distinction between, uh, in, in funds, there's something called active management and passive management. Basically, uh, for most of history, um, all funds were managed actively, and that meant that the fund managers, the, the GPs in the fund, their job was to look at all of the stocks in the stock market and go out and do a bunch of research and talk to the companies and identify the ones that they thought were good. and the sell side, the investment banks were always saying, you should pick this one, you should pick this one. But in the end of the day, the, the fund managers, they represent the, the buy side, and they would make a bunch of decisions, and they would pick a bunch of stocks, and the fund would hold those stocks. Uh, and then they would constantly be following the news, and they would sell, sell some stocks or buy some derivatives to, to manage their portfolio actively. Um, what has become a very popular trend in investment strategy in the past 10, 20 years uh, is, is passive fund management, which basically means um, it's basically like taking a big breath and saying like, I give up, I can't beat the market, so I'm just going to play the market. And uh, passive, passive management would, would basically just be, uh, you've heard of the S&P 500, which are the, the largest 500 companies in, uh, in the US stock market. And it would just be like, look, forget it. I'm just going to have a fund, and it just has the, the 500 biggest companies. And if one of those companies uh, gets so you know shrinks, and another company gets bigger, I'm going to sell that guy's stock and buy this guy's stock. Whoever the top 500 are, that's who's in my portfolio. Um, that would be one example, but there could be any. There are, there are now thousands of passively managed funds where basically instead of doing constant research and making lots of decisions, you basically just write an algorithm, you make a rule. You say, I'm gonna buy the top 10 stocks in the Irish stock market, or I'm gonna buy the, it, it doesn't have to be by geography, it could be by theme. So I'm gonna buy the, my fund will hold the top 10 um, internet search companies because I think internet search is the future, or the top 10 
uh, you know, oncology drug companies. Um, these passive strategies are often turned into products that can be bought and sold um, by retail investors like us and are called ETFs. Has anybody heard the term ETF? Stands for exchange traded fund. Um, and it's basically, uh, the ETFs have much lower fees than hedge funds, for example. Um, and they have lower fees because you don't have to do much. Once, once you structure the product, uh, you, you write a bunch of rules for which stocks go in at what point, and the, the, the portfolios kind of manage themselves, essentially. Um, it's it's rules-based rather than uh, actively picking. Um, I put this as a distinction because passive funds, which are an increasing, uh, have been gaining increasing market share, um, don't require any conversations, any communication between investors and companies. Uh, it is, as I said, algorithmic. It's, it's purely a matter of does this company fit certain preset criteria, yes or no? If yes, then they're in. If no, then they're not. Um, and it's really only active fund management that would require a lot of in-depth conversations uh, to gain an analytical edge. Um, gap and non-gap. Have you seen these? Have you, have you seen the term gap? Do you know what gap stands for? Yes. Good. What, what is it? Generally accepted. Yes. Uh, generally accepted accounting principles. I think it's principles, uh, but we can check. Uh, so gap numbers are basically um, the SEC wants to make sure there's you know thousands and thousands of companies in the stock market. Investors are looking at all of them. Um, they're reporting their financial information all the time. The SEC wants to make sure that investors can compare apples to apples that all of the financials that are being reported are being reported in the same format. Um, because if you have, there are, it turns out, accounting is a science, but it's also an art. <laughs> there's a lot of ways to present a company's financials. Um, if all the companies present them differently, it becomes, you know, the SEC says that makes it difficult for investors to, to do a fair comparison. So the SEC demands that all companies uh, provide their information in gap format. Um, many companies believe that the gap, uh, the, the principles, there's no right or wrong. <laughs> we, 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 we think of accounting, if anything, accounting should be one thing that is just like, it's ultimate truth, right? Like it's just numbers don't lie, right? The truth is there are many ways of doing accounting for a company. And so many companies say that gap doesn't properly reflect my company's value or it's not the, it's not the right numbers to be showing, that these are not the, the most relevant way, that it's not the most relevant metrics for looking at my company. Um, so uh, many companies, and, and so for example, the DAUs and MAUs are an example of like, those are not gap metrics, they, they're non-financial metrics. They, you know, if I have a mobile app company and I have zero dollars in revenue, but I have a hundred million people using my app every single day, you can't tell me the company, the value of my company is zero, right? If, if I just report my gap numbers, you might say, well, you have zero revenue, like you're not a company. Um, but I would say, wait, but look at this other stuff, right? So um, non-gap number, non numbers are usually financial metrics, uh, so, so not DAU, MAU. Um, but they are alternate, they're, they're alternate ways of presenting a company's financial situation that companies sometimes present, they have to present the gap numbers, and sometimes they also present the non-gap numbers and use the earnings calls, for example, to explain why they, they, they'll say to investors, forget the gap, focus on the non-gap numbers, um, which is a controversial practice. Um, and one of the most common non-gap numbers that are used are uh, EBITDA. 
Did you guys all heard of EBITDA? EBITDA. Yes. Yeah, kind of heard between all of you. I heard all the words. Earnings before interest tax depreciation and amortization. Right. Uh, so that is a non-GAAP number. That is not uh, part of the the kind of standard reporting format. Um, but a lot of companies think it's a it's a more fair way of evaluating the revenues. Um, there are technical reasons for that, but I don't quite remember. Uh, and then finally, um, buy side and sell side incentives. Uh, and this kind of loops back a little bit to the, to the conversation about corporate access. Um, both, both the buy side and the sell side conduct research on companies. Um, they both have, so there are two, there, there are terms, buy side analyst and sell side analyst. And those are jobs that people have uh, and they, sit at a desk all day and they just study everything there is to know about Alibaba or Tesla or Walmart or whatever. And uh, it's called coverage. They cover a particular company. And in, in the industry, sometimes a company is called a name. So they, they cover a name, which means they research a company. Um, and uh, the buy side is a very direct analysis, right? They are, they're representing investors and they're looking at all these companies and they are, they want to find the good ones. And so they're all day long, they're looking at the financials, they're looking at the non-financial numbers, they're looking at the narrative stuff, yada, yada, yada. And they're going to go tell their bosses, the investors, hey boss, I think Alibaba stock's going to go up, so we should buy Alibaba stock. Simple as that. The sell side does the same thing uh, in they're conducting the same research on the same companies. And the sell side is taking those reports that they write, and instead of going to their bosses, they're going to the buy side, including sometimes the sell side analysts go to the buy side analysts. And look, the buy side analysts are busy, right? Like they've got a lot going on. So the sell side analysts, they're like hyper focused. They are, they know more, you know, somebody at Goldman Sachs knows more about Alibaba than anybody else in the world. They have a whole department of people, whole teams of people that are working on covering Alibaba. And they go to a fund manager and they say, look, we've done all this research. You're our best client. You know, we want, uh, we want you to be successful. So we're going to give you this research. Um, and usually the sell side reports they come with a, a very simple recommendation on a, on a stock. It says buy, hold, or sell. Uh, there, are, there are different ways of phrasing that. They sometimes say underweight, neutral, overweight. Um, it comes with a target price, which is basically like, this is what the analyst thinks the stock price should be or where, where it will be. And this is where it is now. So if it's currently below the target price, you should buy the stock because it, you know, it will go up to meet the target. Uh, if it's above the target, um, you should sell the stock so that it doesn't you know, lose money when it falls. Um, but when I, when I talk about the incentives, there's, uh, there's, there's, an, there's an interesting thing here where the sell side has, okay, the buy side, when it's covering a company, when a buy side analyst is covering a company, it's pretty objective. It just wants to know the truth of whether this is a good company or not, um, because uh, they they want their fund to make the right decision. The sell side has a little you could it's argued a little bit of a conflict of interest because let's say this let's say Goldman Sachs is covering Alibaba and it's writing recommendations to its clients. Um, you know, you should buy or sell the stock. On the one hand, the investment bank is trying to provide good research to the buy side um, to help them make informed decisions. Uh, but in another department of the investment bank, Goldman Sachs is also trying to win the right to help 
Alibaba, you know, they, they helped underwrite their IPO, or they are going to help them with a capital raise, or uh, Alibaba is going to acquire another big company, and Goldman Sachs wants to be the advisor on that, uh, on that deal. So there are many ways in which the sell side has incentives to promote companies that, that they work with um, that might tint their, uh, their analysis of it. Um, so given that, you know, you'd say the buy side should know that, right? So why would the buy side even pay attention to the buy sell hold recommendations? There is a, again, kind of a theory that the buy side gets reports from the investment banks and they don't care at all about the, it's not like they read the buy recommendations so they go buy the stock. They might not care about those reports at all. Potentially, the only thing that the buy side wants from these analysts is corporate access. It's not the reports, don't give me the reports, I'm doing my own research, I'm doing my own analysis, I'll look at the numbers myself, thank you very much. But can you get me a meeting with the chief product officer of Alibaba? So that is, uh, you know, the, the dynamic between the buy side and the sell side, and how research uh, plays a role is um, is always is always very interesting. This is a very interesting kind of dynamic. Um, and recently, in Europe, they just passed a new law called I, I can never pronounce. I don't know how it's pronounced. It's M-I-F-I-D, MIFID, um, and it applies across the EU uh, and is having a big impact on the investment banking business. And basically, it, the rule is that you cannot, you can no longer give research away for free. You have to charge for research. Uh, and in the past, um, the sell side, the, the investment banks would give away research to investors for free in the hopes to get something else from them. So when you buy a bunch of stock, come to me and I'll help you execute the trade. You know, we'll, we'll be the, the broker dealer for your trades. Uh, and in the meantime, here's a bunch of research that is kind of goodwill. Um, that will in the future no longer be allowed. Uh, investment banks will have to separately price their, it's called debundling. They'll debundle their research from all of the other services that they sell, uh, and and they'll have to clearly um, price it to market. Um, that is having a lot of implications on how the buy side and sell side analysts work with each other, uh, or even if they work with one another. Because now the buy side is saying, "Man, I have to pay for research. Well, if I'm going to pay for research, why do I assume?" You're, you know, it's fine if you give it to me for free, but once I have to pay, I'm going to start to shop around and see where I can get the best value for money. Uh, and so it's disrupting a lot of the established relationships, and it's also pushing a lot of research budgets away from investment banks towards um, groups like the expert networks, where you get access to subject to, to subject experts, to technical experts, because an investor is going to say, well, if I'm going to invest in the sausage factory, you know, sure, if you if an investment gives investment bank gives me a research report on sausage factory, I'll read it. But if I have to pay to do for research on a sausage factory, maybe I should pay to talk to this guy over here who has worked in a sausage factory for 50 years. Like maybe he could tell me something more useful than a guy at JP Morgan. Um, so that is, is kind of one of the, the dynamics that's uh, changing. Guys, we're, we're running low on time. Um, I do want to give you chances for, for questions. Uh, this is a um, a repeat from uh, from the previous session. My suggested readings for for finance. Um, read the read the news guys, every day. Uh, and now that you are have been through two money talk sessions, obviously you are experts. Um, I put I want to I want to put a special highlight on epsilon theory, and um, and have just realized that in addition to a podcast. There's an, also an excellent blog uh, at epsilontheory.com. Um, it is basically content marketing for a hedge fund in Connecticut. And the chief investment officer of this hedge fund also, this is typical, owns a 40-acre farm in Connecticut. 
and he's like a hyper passionate farmer. And so he writes this blog, and I, I'm telling you, it's really fascinating stuff. He writes a blog that examines how different farm animals on his farm, like the behavior, their biological behavior in this agricultural ecosystem is a representative or an allegory for market participants in capital markets. I won't say any more than that besides it's just fascinating. You learn about chickens and bees and raccoons and, like, and, 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 and then apply that to like the financial crisis and Bitcoin. It's fascinating stuff. That's uh, his Epsilon Theory, is that the blog? Yes, so okay. EpsilonTheory.com, I'm just giving you a little, uh, a little plug. Um, but most importantly, uh, sign up for uh, our own content at cadencetranslate.com slash learn. Um, and please uh, keep in touch with me um, through my email here, as well as on LinkedIn, where, where I post a lot about finance and language. Uh, guys, thank you so much. It's 1.45. I haven't left a lot of time for questions, but I really, really appreciate you spending this time with me today. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I don't have anything to do this afternoon. Uh, you guys probably do, so you're, you're welcome to sneak out at any point, um, but if you do have questions, I'm, I'm happy to take them. Um, so if somebody's interested in learning more about working in this field as an interpreter, do you recommend that we focus more on, let's say, more in-depth knowledge of a specific industry that might be relevant for our language here and specializing more in that? Or is it more important to specialize in like general financial jargon and that sort of, I mean, obviously both are gonna be needed if you're interpreting yeah. some of these conversations you outlined, but where do you find, what, what sort of knowledge really gives a person in yeah. edge? Uh, good question. You know the answer is both. Um, I think, I mean, the, the rationale behind this, this series is that money is really what connects all of these different, you know, business sectors and politics and international conferences and private meetings. You kind of have to know this stuff, I think, to just be engaged in the global economy. Um, so, I think a generalist understanding of finance is really important. Uh, I'm really excited about the, the upcoming Money Talks 3 uh, with Training the Street, where we'll, we'll really look at how a balance sheet is structured and what a financial like income statement looks like. Because um, I think those are good, important life skills and very useful across any interpreting that you're going to be doing. Um, once you have that, you know, it's like, look, at the, at the base pyramid, there's like language skills. You need language skills. And then on top of that, you need interpreting skills. And then on top of that, I think you, you could argue like you need global business and economic knowledge. And then on top of that, any vertical, what are called industry verticals um, that are relevant to your language pair are really certain. So if you do Russian, like oil and gas, you probably have you know, a pretty good thing to know. Um, it, you know, in, in China, we do a lot with like energy, environment, uh, manufacturing. It's like good, good to know that stuff. Um, but so the answer is they're they're both helpful. But I I frankly would prioritize like a generalist business and finance understanding, uh, and then focus on uh, on a And you work more in public or private language? Um, I don't know. I haven't really measured it out, but it's a good question. I also, I don't know just generally in the world economy how large the public equity market is versus the private equity market. Private equity market is hard to, it's like a long tail, right? There's some like, there's the Ubers and Airbnbs, but then there's like a lot of lemonade stamps. So, uh, I don't know. Um, when Cadence contracts an interpreter to cover like a, an earnings call, how, what kind of materials, if any, are they provided in advance? So for an earnings call, um, uh, we, yeah, again, we, we, we are pretty preliminary in our work with earnings calls. Um, we, we think it has a lot of potential uh, where if you have an earnings call go out, broadcast it in 10 different languages, um, but it, we're, we're still in, in early phases of that. 
uh, earnings call, you would get access to the quarterly earnings, the, the quarterly report um, beforehand. Um, and a ton of, you know, one thing that at Cadence we do, uh, because a lot of our meetings are have very short notice, some, sometimes just several hours, we have a team that helps prepare uh, qualitative information and glossaries about companies before, or industries beforehand. And so we internally, we have a, a, a sectoral glossary library. Um, so if it's Tesla, for example, um, we, we already have a lot about the automotive sector, a, a lot of glossaries and background information, uh, and then would do kind of more tailored information, more tailored research about this company and provide it to the interpreters before. Any other questions? How serious of growth do you see in the future now? Like, uh, right now, a lot of these calls that you're working with, but is there a plan to do more than that? I heard investor calls, uh, but anything else? What do you mean for interpreters? Yeah, for the interpreting in this field, in the financial field. Uh, absolutely. So, um, Expert networks are currently our biggest segment, and we think it's just going to get bigger and bigger. Uh, there's an article in Bloomberg recently about how expert networks as an industry, which are not very well known, like most people don't know about expert networks, even most business people don't know about expert networks. But with the rules that are changing how research is paid for, uh, the, the expert network market share and research is just going like this. And, and we think we're in a, in a really good position to, to capture that. And one of the constraints, one of the bottlenecks to that growth is, inter is good interpreters. <laughs> okay. uh, so like we have an opportunity, I like to say, we're, we're selling shovels in a gold rush where this little niche sector is about to, is poised for a boom. And if, you know, all of us collectively can, can sell high quality interpreting services, um, that becomes very interesting for, for us and, and offers access to a much broader range of, of knowledge in the market. So th this is one, one, one thing that I like to say is like, there is actually a lot of public material information that is very valuable to investors that is just across the language barrier. And we can play a huge, we become very, very valuable if we can help an investor uncover a relevant, tradable piece of information. So does Cadence provide translation, factory translation service as well? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we are, and we're, we're also seeing, uh, I, I don't know how much uh, this covers this, huge demand for transcription. Um, for transcription and polishing of, uh, these, of these expert network calls um, and, and earnings calls. Um, fast turnaround, high precision, high accuracy, uh, and they're willing to pay for it. And it's, it's a great business. So, uh, so that's definitely a huge um, kind of potential growth point as well. Uh, and and it, you know, obviously you sell them the interpreting, I'll sell them the transcription and the translation you know, into many other languages for their multiple offices, it becomes big. So for the transcription, do you use a human transcriber or do you put it through machine translation? No, not for English. What is my English kind of system that you post editing? For, for English, uh, we do, do uh, a first draft for machine and then post edit it uh, with, with humans. And we oftentimes ask the, we'll have an interpreter on the call and we'll ask the interpreter to do the post editing uh, because they were already on the call. Like they know exactly what happened um, and they have the context. Uh, and so we're, we're that, that is for Cadence a, a big growth sector. We are charging a premium because um, we're having interpreters do transcription plus editing. I mean, it's expensive, um, but uh, we're able to turn around a you know top-notch quality human polished work faster than almost anybody in the business. There are some cool companies uh, like Rev.com and AI Sense that are working in the in the voice recognition space. Uh, so this is where where humans and technology are going to have to work together. You mentioned several times short turnaround time, right? Um, and so it, it must be affecting the 
freelancers. Yeah. What tips do you need for your freelance? How to manage your time? On time management? Because you get, you, get you get an assignment short notice. Yeah. Okay? Um, well, I think uh, the shorter the notice you have, the more important your foundational training is. So I would turn it around and say, you know, that's why, uh, that's why you're here. Um, because because uh, hopefully you know with the with the foundational skills that, that you have you'll you'll be battle ready in almost any circumstances um as as i described earlier we do everything we can where we have a team now of, of project coordinators that will help you do research in the short period of time that you have and make it as easy as possible um so i i guess my uh my tip would be macro contextualization like you know we'll provide the glossary with all the specific names if you only have an hour before you go into a call about um glass manufacturing uh i would read as much macro information about the glass industry as possible um just the, the mechanics of like where does glass come from who buys the raw materials? Where is it manufactured? Who, where is the downstream? We have classes. Okay. Sorry, guys, uh, out of time, but thank you again all for coming and uh, please thank you for your time. Thank you. They're early stage venture backed. Oh, no. Of course, I'm sorry. I'm terribly sorry about that. What do you mean? Oh, yes. Thanks for your time. I'll just turn this off so that. How do I get out of here?